welcome to First Fridays. We are all happy to have you here live in person at our museum. My name is Marisol Jara. I'm the manager of public programs here at the Natural History Museum. Again, thank you for joining us today. And welcome to our 2022 First Fridays season. From seeds to psychedelics. Yes. This season, we look to the power of plants to save us, <clears throat> returning to the roots of well-being with new ideas drawn from ancient ways. Each month, join us for dynamic discussions designed to be thought-provoking and inspiring. We'd like to acknowledge our media partner, KCRW, and our event partner, I Am Sound, tonight as well. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our moderator, not only for tonight, but for the entire season, Please welcome neuroscientist and science communicator, Dr. Yowande Piers. Take it away. Thank you, Marisol, for the introduction. And I was going to make an April Fool's joke, but you beat me to it. So. Yeah. <laughs> welcome, everyone. It's so great to be with you all. If this is your first First Fridays, then a special warm welcome. And if you're returning, then it's great to see you again. We're so excited to continue our program, inspired by plants from seeds to psychedelics. And tonight, we're going to be journeying into foraging for our discussion titled Wild Harvesting. So we're going to be touching on some questions. What are some of the first steps? What are some of the pitfalls if you're new to wild harvesting? And we're really going to be looking to the wisdom of Native American foraging traditions for guidance for how to bring this ancient practice into our modern lives. So I'm very excited to introduce our guest for this evening, Heidi Lissero, American Indian Studies lecturer at California State University, Long Beach, tribal chairwoman. Yeah. <laughs> Let's give a round of applause. Tribal chairwoman for the Wananyo Band of Mission Indians, Ajashiman Nation, and a native artist. Welcome, Heidi, to First Fridays. Okay, so to start our discussion, we're going to be talking about foraging, but we're also talking about wild harvesting. So just to kind of understand a little bit of the terminology, I know the concept of foraging is something that you intentionally don't use to describe the practice that you do, and instead you've described yourself more of a cultural bearer. So how has your personal journey with wild harvesting brought you to identifying in this way, or rather how has this way of identifying brought you to wild harvesting? Well, I think that um, my whole journey began as a basket weaver and going out and gathering basket materials, um, you see that um, our gathering areas are getting um, smaller and smaller due to urban sprawl. So then we have, a, you know, after I learned how to um, weave baskets and gather those materials, then um, I started learning about our traditional foods. And um, then again, we run into the same problem about being able to um, harvest um, sustainably when our gathering areas are more limited. So um, when you go out and gather, you have to learn how to gather sustainably mm -hmm. in order for us to continue these traditions um, and um, teach our children how to um, you know, eat our traditional foods and gather their, um, the traditional foods and when to gather. Um, so that's really um, what brought me to that is um, learning how to do it sustainably so that this practice can be continued into the future. Yeah, and I think we're going to talk a lot about how when it comes to harvesting, it's really not just about food, but there are so many different right. elements of the practice that are so interesting, and we're going to dive into that. But I think sustainability is going to be a theme throughout this discussion because, of course, I have never gone wild harvesting, but even in one of our preliminary conversations, it really inspired me But how do we go out then and do this sustainably is really important to focus on. So as we've heard, you've hinted a little bit about the basket weaving, and your practice really does go beyond gathering just food. And so I've read that you can describe wild harvesting as wild crafting or wild tending, which tends to be a more conscious approach to harvesting. So there are invasive and there are non-invasive plants. So so the invasive plants are the ones that aren't native to the land, and then the non-invasive non ones are the native plants. And you actually harvest both of them. So 
For example, I know that you can use like non-invasive plants like acorns can be used for traditional soups and that the juncus reeds are part of what you use for the basket weaving. So can you explain a little bit about how these harvesting practices are important for sustainability and then also how you can consider wild harvesting to be a form of environmental activism? Um, so Gathering traditional foods is something that um, I wasn't brought up with, but in order to continue those traditions, I had to learn. Um, I um, learned how to gather acorns, when to gather them, um, how to process them, because it's a very long process to make um, anything with acorn. Um, so I learned how to do that. Um, and as I was gathering not only basket material, but food um, items as well, I noticed that there is a lot of um, invasive plants that are out there. So part of um, what we do as um, basket weavers and traditional food gatherers, um, we have to create these relationships, um, not only with the plants that we're gathering, but also with the um, different um, departments, um, forestry, um, national parks, state parks, in order to gather on those areas. Um, and so part of the reciprocity that we get back is to help them do non-native um, plant, plant abatement. So we go out and um, help them clear like mustard from um, the areas in the um, park system. We gather, we help them do abatement of arundo in a lot of the creek beds. Um, but we also gather other, <clears throat> excuse me, um, uh, invasive plants that um, we eat as well. So um, we do a workshop, um, a group of us, that's called Eating Your Invasives. So um, we gather things that you probably would just, um, any person that doesn't know what they are, would gather them or, you know, spray weed killer. Um, we actually gather them and eat them, um, such as the lamb's quarter, the purse lanes, the mallow. So we gather all those and we actually teach people how to um, use those invasive plants and incorporate them into your everyday diet. That's amazing. So I'm really fascinated about the acorns. So let's stay on them a little bit because okay. I know that there is so much that you do with the acorn. So in LA, for example, where would you harvest for those sorts of um, for those sorts of plants? So up in the Angeles National Forest, there's a, a lots of places to gather there, but um, a lot of the streets in LA are lined with oak trees. A lot of people's front yards have oak trees in them. So. Um, in the fall, we gather the, the acorns and we process the acorns. So I have people that call me and say, I have acorns for you, you know, because they know <laughs> that I come and gather them. So um, I don't always have to go out and um, harvest myself. Um, but um, so I have people that give them to me. But um, I've noticed in the past few years uh, with the drought and with a lot of the fires that have occurred that the harvest isn't as um, big as it used to be. So. So you're actually seeing that mm -hmm. diminishing supply of those acorns. And so when you talk about how lengthy this practice is, um, what is it that makes it take so long? So I know that you use it for the soup as well, and then you use other elements. Um, so we use it for the soup. Um, we actually, um, when you get the acorn, you have to um, dry them out, then you have to crack them, and then you have to grind them, and then you have to um, take the flour that you get from grinding them, and you have to leach the tannic acid out, which is a long process. Um, and um, then after that, you can cook it into soup. Um, but um, it's not a soup like, um, I always say it's similar to um, um, kind of like malto meal, that consistency. Um, it's a little bit bitter, um, but it's really an acquired taste. Um, so um, it's something that um, we have to get people used to. I mean, our palates aren't used to that taste. Um, um, Americans in general are used to, you know, sugar and flour and salt in their foods. Um, it's something that's very kind of, and besides a little bit of bitter, it's kind of bland. So it's something that, you know, is takes getting used to. I bet, so I bet you're thrilled when people keep bringing you acorns. <laughs> <laughs> um, what is so elderberry is also another thing that you harvest, which is has a sweet element to it, it and does. that's available in LA. Yeah, um, we um, yeah, it's available everywhere. Once you see an elderberry tree, you'll always recognize it has these big um, 
uh, flower heads that are yellow flowers. Um, that's a plant that we can be used for so many things. Um, the flowers are a medicine. Um, they can be used as a fever reducer um, or a tea. Um, the um, berries are used for um, cough syrup um, and they help you um, boost your immune system. Um, you could actually buy it in the store, um, and, but I prefer to make my own. Um, and so the sticks are used for musical instruments, so, and all the leaves and stems can be used um, for basketry dye. So um, the whole plant is useful to us. So yeah, your practice is really using the whole of the plant in lots right. of creative ways. Um, I think we may have an image actually of the yucca flower which goes into the weaving baskets that you mm -hmm. make, which is also the yucca reeds. Yeah, the oh, uh, first so one is um, where I'm gathering elderberries. Um, and then the yucca flowers is something from the, um, the yucca whipple eye that we use just about every part, every part of the plant can be used. So that's awesome. Yeah. Um, I know another popular thing that people are into is white sage, and I know that's kind of controversial as well. So can we speak a little bit on sure. white sage and <laughs> why we should be more conscious about harvesting that in particular? Yeah, absolutely. So white sage is a plant that is endemic to Southern California and Northern Mexico. Um, it's a plant that has, um, in the past probably 10 years, it's been really appropriated by lots of communities and the appropriation is so bad that they're catching people harvesting um, hundreds of pounds um, in private reserves and in areas of the, na um, the national forest. Um, and the purpose of poaching all of this um, white sage is not for personal use, it's to sell it. And you're seeing uh, white sage being sold all over the world on all kinds of different websites. It's been used, um, it's been seen on Walmart, on Sephora, on Etsy, and all these um, <clears throat> different places that, um, um, and this is a medicine that um, we consider it a medicine as um, the indigenous people of Southern California and the people that um, should be using it are even having trouble um, being able to get it um, because it's being poached so much. Um, when we talk about um, sustainable harvesting, when people are going out and poaching this, they're not sustainably harvesting white sage. They are pulling it out of the roots so it doesn't even have a chance to grow again or grow back. Um, I like to liken this um, with, when I create a relationship with plants that I gather, I um, there's a sense of reciprocity. When I go, I don't always go to gather, I go to, um, to tend, I go to clean up. Um, I give an offering every time I go, I say a prayer when I go and um, let them know that that plant is gonna be taken and it's gonna be used for myself or for elders that I'm gathering for. Um, and I take sustainably, I don't go and rip things out of the roots. So when I look at plants like sage and the other plants that we gather, I look at them as relatives, not as um, something that I'm commodifying. So when you look at something as a relative and you create that relationship with that plant, um, I always say, I'm not gonna go and rip my grandmother out of um, the ground so I can go sell her. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, and that's how, I mean, that's really how I think about it. You know, when you create these relationships with plants, um, and animals, you don't um, do bad things to them. You treat them with kindness and respect. So, um, and that's not what's happening when people are poaching white sage and using it for ceremonies that is not part of their culture. Yeah, I understand. And also I think with the white sage, it's really important, you're talking about connectivity and having this conscious relationship, but it's also important for the wildlife as well. And right. so when you're thinking about taking things in that way, you need to be thinking about the bigger picture. So thanks for sharing that. Um, I guess in order to be able to think about why it's so sustainably, you have to do your research, I guess, is the yeah. bottom line. <laughs> okay, so 
let's move on a little bit to talk about um, these harvesting areas and actually what's available. So you talked about the fact that you can just walk down the street and often you'll see all sorts of fruit trees, which is great in LA, so much grows. But in terms of access, to harvesting areas is actually a real issue it seems because there are barriers to access in terms of legality around the land and that is having an impact specifically on indigenous communities which I know is something that you're very passionate about. So how does the existence of private and government lands actually affect your wild harvesting practices? Like how do you get away from those um, limitations and around those barriers? So. Um you bring up a good point. You know, there's a lot of land um, that, especially my tribe is not federally recognized, so we don't have any land. There's not a federally recognized tribe here in Los Angeles either, so they don't have land. Um, one of um, the things that I really like to do is I like to gather in areas that I know that my, ancestor get, my ancestors gathered. So um, in order to do that, um, I have to create relationships with um, the Cleveland National Forest um, and with um, those areas where my ancestral gathering areas are in order to gather in those areas. Um, sometimes it's not as easy. <laughs> um, so when we ac harvest acorns, um, we harvest once a year um, to gather, well, like one time during the year in the fall. When you, we're harvesting for basket materials, um, every ma different material that goes into a basket has to be gathered at a different time of the year. Wow, so, that takes a lot of organization. Yeah, <laughs> so in order to get a, um, a pass or a permit to gather in the um, National Forest, um, we have to get a per permit every year. So it's, um, and usually when we go there, there's somebody new in office, so we have to explain the whole situation over. So it's kind of um, tedious to do it, but um, usually, um, since I'm a basket weaver, and I have been for like 25 years, um, I'm usually the one that gets the passes for everybody in the tribe. Um, so only one of us has to go in and talk. Um, <laughs> but um, when it comes to private land, um, where there is a lot of private land that um, we know are traditional gathering areas. Um, sometimes we cross onto private land and we don't know it. And we've had run-ins with people um, that are not very happy that we're on their land. Um, and they want to know why we're there. And so I usually, um, I'd say 99% of the time, once we explain to them what we're doing there, why we're gathering, um, they're really good with it. So, and then they welcome us back anytime. Um, there's other areas that we gather um, that aren't so safe. Sometimes we gather on the side of the freeway. Sometimes we um, climb fences, which I probably should have put that picture up there <laughs> of us climbing over fences. Um, and um, we now have a, a funny practice where when we go behind a fence, even if we're allowed there, there's, if there's a no trespassing sign, we like to take a picture behind the sign. <laughs> um, but um, because, I mean, we're just traveling in those areas where our ancestors were and um, creating those connections with the land and those relationships with the plants and animals in those areas. Yeah, and it sounds like also a lot of that access can also be resolved through having these relationships with either the parks or whoever has the private land. I know that access to private land is something that um, people can do to harvest regularly. So for, you know, for anyone who wanted to get into wild harvesting, I mean, that is an access barrier, but I think there are also other barriers which would be great to talk about, which is education. So actually that is a huge barrier, understanding how to harvest, and then also the diversity and the inclusion that can sort of also be a, a consideration within harvesting communities. So uh, yeah, in terms of those barriers, how would you advise that people could navigate those? So I think that um, first and foremost, uh, when you if you're not native and you want to, um, you know, to wild harvest, um, you should first um, contact whoever is in the area, tribal-wise, um, because they're going to give you some good pointers and um, maybe even let you go out gathering with them. <laughs> um, and um, they're going to teach you how to gather sustainably. Um, I take people out all the time, you know. Um, one of my other things is, is if you want to 
um, use sage or you want to um, you know, use acorn, learn how to do it. My suggestion is for me, I grow all my basket plants at home. I, you know, so I don't have to wild harvest because um, right now our supplies of basket material, food materials um, is not sustainable even for our own communities, let alone um, people outside of our native community. So I always suggest to grow sage at your home. Um, I grow all my basket materials at my house. Um, Find a friend who has an acorn tree at their house. Ask them if you can come and gather. A lot of times they'll pick them all up for you and have them ready for you. I have people who do that all the time. Um, you know, learn how to um, gather things, um, you know, that are, you know, growing in the neighborhood. You know, learn plant identification. Learn when the right time is to harvest those things. Um, there's lots of good resources. Um, California Indian Basket Weavers has um, a website. They you know, talk about sustainable um, practices. Um, be an advocate for native communities and in turn, you know, creating those relationships as reciprocity. So um, being able to do that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Heidi. Actually, I think that reaching out to those um, native communities for the, the wisdom to be able to harvest in a sustainable way is definitely an amazing first step and actually also mentioning that this exchange between friends of plants or, or trees that you might have in your backyard actually just reminds me of a really sad story because our neighbor um, their house got bought up and they had this amazing fig tree that we would take for granted and it just was fruiting and then the next day it had been cut down because oh, of the people no. who had moved in wanted to clear the backyard for development but if no one's cutting down your trees, <laughs> but having that exchange is, is a really great way to do it. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you actually grew up in LA, so I feel like you're a very good person to talk to about how the landscape is changing in terms of harvesting areas. And one of the things I think we'll go back into this with a bit more detail, but just to extend on what you've just shared, is how things are changing. So are there areas to avoid at the moment that you think if you are gonna go out and wild harvest, where we need to be a little bit more careful? Um, I would say, in careful in what terms? What do you mean? In careful <laughs> in terms of, so where you're beginning to see, for example, with the weaving baskets, the materials you need, you're not seeing as many um, acorns or reeds for that. I think in general, because of urban sprawl, we're seeing less and less gathering areas. So, for example, where I used to gather um, five miles out, now I'm having to go 10 or 15 miles out to gather mm -hmm. because of urban sprawl. And um, not just that, because there's so many more people, there's, much, um, there's a lot more pesticides that people are using, so you really have to be careful of those things. Um, even with um, our relationship with the national park is we have to really tell them, okay, this is food area and basket area. Please don't put pesticides there. So you really have to understand that relationship um, because the first thing as, um, you know, a food item, of course, is going to go in your mouth. But when we're talking about things like basket materials, the, as weavers, we put all that material in our mouth as we're weaving. And, you know, we have elders that end up sick. We have people that end up with rashes because oh, of, gosh. you know, things that, you know, um, they aren't aware of. And it's, um, it's, that is very dangerous for us. So if you don't know um, if something's been sprayed in that area, their best bet is not to gather in that area. That is a very good tip. I was actually going to ask a question because <laughs> I feel like I would definitely be someone who would grab some wild berries, eat them. It wouldn't be good. Um, I'll definitely poison myself with pesticides. So on that topic, we've talked a little bit about the dangers to wild harvesting and how important it is to keep sustainability in mind. Um, and you've touched a little bit now on the dangers of wild harvesting. Um, but particularly for people who are new to this, I, I don't know how many wild harvesters there are amongst us. Um, could we spend a little bit more time talking about some of the pitfalls to avoid or some of the things that we need to be thoughtful about? Um, yeah, I would um, definitely caution people, especially um, in the LA and Orange County area, if you're going to gather, be really careful of your surroundings, not just um, there's a lot of wildlife and they're being pushed out um, 
further where we're gathering. So be careful of wildlife. Um, make sure you go with somebody. Um, the other thing is, <clears throat> is be aware of your plant identification. Um, I have people that have gone out um, without me together and they come home and they're like super mad because they're like, I went in that area you went to and now I have poison oak all over, you know? <laughs> so um, I'm like, yeah, because you don't know your plant identification. And so, um, you know, and because we don't have the amount of wildfires, um, uh, like we were talking about cold burns, um, that burns those fuels down, that um, things like poison oak are just out of control. Um, so I think that that is one of the things, make sure you know plant identification, especially if you're gathering things like mushrooms and other things. Um, I don't gather very many mushrooms, I'm just kind of coming into that. Um, but so my identification is terrible, um, so I have to rely on my friends that um, you know plant, ident you know, mushroom identification. Um, one of the other things is when you harvest, don't take everything. You know, go there, take what you need. Um, if you're gathering, like when I go gather, I don't usually gather just for myself. I usually gather for elders, for I have um, people that um, I gather for that can't get out on that rough terrain to gather. Um, but I only gather enough for us. Um, and so make sure that when you go and gather, you don't take everything. Um, when you take everything, you don't give things a chance to replenish and grow back um, for next year. Um, so that's why um, when we talk about wild crafting, make sure you understand when the seasons are that you're supposed to be gathering. There are definitely a season to gather each individual thing that you're gathering. Um, so those are my suggestions. <laughs> Amazing. And I think looking to that, again, that native wisdom is really important. So if people aren't connected to a community specifically, are there any resources you would share for where to look? I mean, we have the internet, which is great, <laughs> but are there any specific um, resources you'd point people towards? Um, I just like California Indian basket weavers, there's lots of tribal communities that um, have websites that you can reach out to. If you want to go out, you want to learn how to gather sustainably, you want to learn um, what we consider reciprocity. Um, you know, I'm always happy to share that wisdom with anybody. Um, it was taught to me, and it's my responsibility to teach it to anybody who asks me for that information. Which I understand there's a cultural barrier that really is consistent with that identity. I'm looking at this picture up here, so would you mind just talking a little bit about um, what's going on? Um, this plant so is and what this is um, creosote bush. This is out up off the 14 freeway. Um, so creosote we use as a medicine. Um, it, we uh, make it into a salve um, and it's got really awesome healing powers. Um, so that's what I was gathering out there. That's amazing. And so you touched a little bit on mushroom harvesting being new to you. And as part of our series theme, we are talking about mushrooms as well. So would you share a little bit about your journey towards harvesting mushrooms as something that's new and um, you're at the beginning of that so journey? So my journey um, to gathering mushrooms is not edible. I mean, I love to eat mushrooms. Everybody should if you don't. <laughs> um, but mine really... Um, came as I um, was, I'm a painter, um, a watercolor artist, so it came by mushroom gathering um, from this mushroom color atlas that I saw um, that uses all these different mushrooms to create these beautiful pigment colors. So that's how that came about. <laughs> that's incredible. So you can actually use the mushroom for the color for painting? For painting and dye as well as edible. Do they serve both purposes? Um, I don't know. I haven't looked yeah, that far into it. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about reciprocity, which I think is very important. It's something that you've spoken about a lot and how to actually practice reciprocity in wild harvesting. So can we focus a little bit now just on what that means to you and um, how we can do this if you're, you're new to this practice. Yeah, so reciprocity is, you know, first and foremost is creating that relationship with that plant or that relative. Um, 
second is when you go out to um, gather or harvest um, is that you um, before you ever take anything from that plant um, or that relative you make sure that you give an offering you give before you take always um, whether it's tobacco sage uh, water especially water here in Southern California um, um, a prayer a song um, and um, the other thing that is um, important when we talk about reciprocity is not always going out to take going out to um, to clean up um, one of the biggest things um, as a weaver that I learned um, about um, going out to clean up and to copus and to clean the area is that's a way to get better um, uh, better basketry plants better sticks better um, junkus better um, tule is to clean up and harvest before you know um, every year so after harvest time you would go out you would clean um, and copus cut back things and the next year when you come back um, you've created that relationship you've um, helped clean up you've given your offering and next year when you come back that your sticks are going to be beautiful so that's something that I learned as a weaver as a food gatherer um, I've also seen that happen is um, if you go out and you tend and clean up your food gathering areas um, your um, supply of food your acorns your <clears throat> um, whatever it is you're gathering your medicine plants is going to be much better so that's something that you made the decision to do is this something that you've noticed in these gathering areas other people outside of your community are doing or it doesn't seem to be something that it is have, something that we all do that you all do okay mm -hmm. so it's a collective effort yeah. to do that so i know that we have a couple of images actually about coal burning which since we're in southern california the wildfires are obviously something that affects us a lot so this is a deliberate burn so could we talk a little bit about coal burning and why that's important and what was happening in this picture yeah absolutely so um, this is actually a intentionally set fire this is in my basketry area in the cleveland national forest um, up off ortega highway um, and this was done last year um, we've been waiting for several years for them to do this um, normally here in california native people did um, a cultural burning we would burn um, the prairie land to bring things in to make things grow better um, to produce new grasses and new shoots that would bring the deer in closer um, we would um, burn um, areas um, so we could have ceremony in those circles um, so burning was something that we did we did on a regular basis um, this burn um, was done <clears throat> it took us i want to say 15 years to get this burn done wow. um, there here specifically in southern california um, there are seven criteria to have a burn a cultural burn or um, um, a burn in an area like this um, it has you have to have the wind conditions are have to be right the um, the humidity and the soil has to be right um, it, the air quality, I mean, there's so many things that have to be perfectly right for it to happen. Um, and so that's why it took so long. Um, and then um, when you have a cold burn like this, it doesn't burn up into the canopy of the trees and it doesn't burn down into the roots of the, um, uh, the ground cover. It only just burns off the top layer and mostly it burns a lot of the non-native species that are invasive. Um, so it's really, really good to have a cold burn like this. This burn actually took like less than an hour to do. Oh, really? Yeah, so um, it took less than an hour. And I want to say it was um, two or three, two and a half or three acres that they burned. Wow. Um, so it was really fast. Um, when you have, when you don't burn the fuels um, in a fire, you know, in um, any forestry area, when you let those fuels um, burn, um, build up and they, you get really deep leaf litter, um, that's when you get really catastrophic fires. Fires that burn way up into the canopy um, that 
burn down complete um, trees, whole forestry ecosystems, and they burn all the way down into the roots where the tree can never, um, where the tree or the um, brush cannot grow back. So that's why it's important um, for us to do small burns like this that actually reduce the fuel and their cold burns and things can grow back. Um, I went back out to this area um, three weeks after this burn and my juncus that they burned all the way down to the ground was already this tall. So um, wow. it's amazing what a, a burn like this will do. It actually puts nitrates back into the soil. Um, it um, brings up the water table. It's amazing for um, the ecosystem. That's incredible. So 15 years takes 15 minutes, <laughs> three acres. Mm -hmm. So I can see that this is the fire department. So this is a coordinated effort. This was a huge coordinated effort. Okay. It was um, forestry, Cal Fire, um, and one other fire department. And they came all the way, from, some of them came from San Diego and LA to come to help. So there was, a, there was probably about 50 firefighters there. So wow. there was no way for it to get out of control. So everyone was around, there were, fire trucks all over, you know. That's amazing. So, it's amazing. So what was one of the reasons for why it took 15 years and how can this be something that is expanded because it obviously has such incredible benefits that, you know, why don't we have more cold burns? Um, because of the drought here in Southern California is one of the main reasons. The water. Yeah. yeah the, that's controlled. Yeah. <laughs> and um, wind conditions, you know, especially during like Santa Ana times, we can't have it then. So it really is... Uh, you really have to have all seven of those criteria that line up to be able to do it. I see. So it's more of an opportuni an opportunistic thing yeah. when everything aligns that you're able to do these cold burns. Right. Well, that's incredible. And I'm glad that you were able to do that work. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. And there was a, there wasn't, I think in the other photo, there was an elderberry tree there that we trimmed back really far. And um, it's growing amazing too. It has more elderberries on it this year than I've ever seen it have on it. So. Wow, that's yeah. really encouraging. Mm -hmm. So that, I think, is a perfect example of one act of reciprocity. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I, when I was reading a little bit about some of the work that you do, there was a story that came up about one of your favorite harvesting stories. So I wondered if you would mind sharing that story. I think it has to do with a mountain lion and encountering one oh, on your... Oh, I did count. Well, that was... <laughs> I actually wasn't gathering that day. Oh, that was I was actually <laughs> out hiking with my son, and we were um, hiking in the Santa Monica Mountains, and we were walking back to the car, and my son says, oh, Mom, look at that deer. And I looked, and I'm like, oh, that's not a deer. <laughs> and th there was actually a hawk that was on the ground, and he was tearing apart um, a smaller bird, and I think that that mountain lion was coming after him until he heard us oh and he gosh, took bigger, off more yeah. Tasty. <laughs> so, yeah but we do encounter mountain lion bobcat you know all of those um animals that you know we try and make sure that you know we go together in a group um together so we don't have those encounters okay so that's an important take home i guess to go in a group it's, not, it's actually a yeah. really fun thing i think to do in community it is a lot of fun yeah, and we go out and a lot of times we'll be singing out there when we're gathering and um, we always say that gathering is, um, although we do have men that gather and we do have men that basket weave, you know, it's kind of the gossip circle when we're gathering, you know, we're out there all <laughs> talking. <laughs> yeah, and it's a time for us all to get together. You know, we all have busy lives. So when we go out together, it's, you know, a time for us to get together and yeah, share what's going on in our lives. <laughs> So right now we're in, it's April, so we're moving into the summer. Is there a particular thing that is really good to kind of gather at the moment if you're going to do it sustainably? Well, in spring, so right now, all the yucca blossoms that you saw up there, they're all beginning to, um, to bloom. So that's time to gather yucca flowers. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing some of those uh, tips on the pitfalls, but also what we could do to be able to be more sustainable in harvesting and how to go about this. So actually, we'd love to hear from the audience. I'm sure that there are lots of questions about harvesting. So one of the Natural History Museum staff will be walking around with a microphone. So if you raise your hands, I can already see one. Then we'll have them come over, and then you can ask a question. Yeah. 
Thanks. Hi, I was just curious because I'm not familiar with white sage, so I was wondering what is it used for and why are people... Um, um, so we use it as um, in ceremony and we um, dry it out and we burn it. Um, a lot of new age cultures, a lot of other communities are now using sage. Um, we use it in something called smudging. Um, a lot of other communities, um, indigenous communities use other things besides sage, um, cedar, um, they use juniper, they use palo santo, they use copal, there's all kinds of different um, things that you can use to sage or smudge and the same thing is happening to those plants um, as is happening to white sage. So if you even just look um, Google like um, smudge kit, you'll see it comes with um, either sage or several of those other items. And um, you'll, some of them you'll, you'll get an abalone shell with, to burn it in, and, or you'll get like a feather with it. So it, they're creating this whole like smudge kit. So um, any of those um, sages that you, or any of the sage that you see in those kits, it all comes from here in Southern California. But, but from what? I mean, what's the medicinal value? Why are you harvesting sage? For smudging. They're used, taking our ceremony, they're appropriating our ceremony um, of smudging and cleansing, um, and they're taking it on as their own. Okay, I think we have another question at the, f at the back here. Hi, uh, I have a friend that had an orange tree in his backyard, and he said that uh, it was above like a sewage line and that the oranges weren't good. How do I know if I don't have somebody with inside information whether or not it's safe to take fruit from a tree? Fruit from a... Uh, if you don't have inside information, or you do? <laughs> in, that, in that scenario, I did not. Uh, I mean, I, my friend lived there, so he told me, but there's like lemon trees on my street. And on the lemon trees, I have no idea if there's like sewage lines or any reason I should be afraid to take the lemons from the tree. Well, I would ask that whoever's tree it belongs to, I would ask them if the, you can take them and I would ask if there's anything on them. You know, most of the time, um, you know, neighborhood um, fruit trees, I mean, especially in my neighborhood, I mean, they um, will leave them out for you. So I don't think that, I mean, I wouldn't leave anything out that had, you know, I sprayed or anything. Um, it would be more um, responsible to ask that person whose tree it is. It's always that moral dilemma when you walk past an orange tree. <laughs> you are actually allowed to just take the, the orange or the lemon. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Um, I think we have another question. Uh, I can't. Right. Oh, over here. Um, I was wondering uh, what your journey was with like learning and being educated on wild harvesting, like when you were educated on wild harvesting, and then like your journey um, being that educator. Um, I learned from um, my aunts. Um, that's who I learned to basket weave from them, and then um, uh, the process just continued, learning how to gather acorns. Um, I have other Native friends that I've learned um, gathering from as well, different types of um, items, uh, items like pine nuts or pinion nuts, learning how to gather those. So it's not necessarily always from my tribe. Um, we do have a whole group of people that um, gather um, I work with a group called Chia Cafe Collective, and um, we are all gatherers, and we kind of share the wealth of information um, about how to gather, when to gather. Um, so they have been a, um, I've been with them for um, probably over 20 years. I've been actually gathering with them. Um, so it's been a lifelong process. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, different oaks uh, have different tastes in the acorns. And I know in the area that I live in, there are four different oaks. Which is your favorite? <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> um, my favorite is the, the California black oak. It's my very favorite. <laughs> yeah. Um, they do. They all have different tastes. Some taste nuttier than others. Some are bitter, more bitter. Some have more tannin in it. I um, I also like the tan oak, but it doesn't grow down here. It's from up north, um, so um, I like that one as well. Um, when I can get it, sometimes I'll go up to some of my friends up north, and we'll um, they'll 
share some of their um, acorn flour with me um, from the tan oak. So that's my other favorite. <laughs> And um, we do a lot of, with the Chia Cafe Collective, we do a lot of um, fusion food because a lot of people don't like the taste of acorns. So we've kind of incorporated it into a bread recipe, a cookie recipe. Um, so um, in order to help ease people into liking it a little bit better. Yeah. I have a question right up here. Oh, okay. Hi, um, so you mentioned the importance of gathering sustainably and also maintaining your own personal garden. I've seen a trend of people in urban areas, um, when they're on walks, they'll take a shaker of uh, seeds from native plants to basically shake that just on the ground wherever where they're walking. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. I think that's a great idea. Um, you know, the more natives that we have, the better. Um, you know, we have lots of other besides um, um, animals like, you know, deer and, you know, um, Mountain lion, we have other animals that rely on native plants as well. We have bees, we have um, butterflies, we have moths, we have um, uh, bats that all rely on native plants, um, you know, to live. And the more natives we have, um, the better off our pollinators are going to do. So it's really important. I think that's a great idea. Have we got another question? I think just over there. Right over here. Uh, Thank you for your time. Uh, you mentioned cultural burning, and I was wondering if, you know, over the years, have you noticed more help and a shift toward uh, going towards more cultural burning from like institutions like Caltrans, I mean, uh, Cal Fire and things like that, because it's cultural or burning was banned for so long, like, you know, Smokey the Bear. Have you? I think that I've, um I haven't seen the, I mean, well, I guess down in Palomar, they have had a lot of cultural burns down there. Um, but I think that um, because of the conditions, the drought conditions in Southern California, we haven't seen as many as even Cal Fire would like. So I think that um, the relationship that we've built with forestry and Cal Fire um, and the hot shots that go out and do a lot of the prep work before um, a burn, I think that, um, creating that relationship with them and making them understand the importance of a burn, a cultural burn, um, and even having them willing to um, have someone like me as just a native person going out there telling them, you need to clear this and you need to clear that and you need to trim that limb, um, and having them just be willing to, um, you know, kind of do whatever we ask them to do. I think that that ha speaks leaps and bounds that, you know, about the, future of um, cultural burns. Yeah. And there's another question. I have one right here. Um, I kind of have two questions. How often do you harvest? Um, how often or how often would I like to go <laughs> to harvest? Yeah, I guess my question. My I question. would like to harvest every day if I could. Um, I actually do harvest every day from my front yard. Um, whether it's basket material or um, I have taken out my completely taken out my front yard um, grass and I have um, um, raised bed planters in my yard where I grow my own food so I actually harvest every day um, but um, to actually go out I probably go out um, two or three times a week um, a month to go actually um, gather okay um, so do you only buy make your food or do you ever go to farmers markets when you don't have the time or accessibility uh, um, I wondering. go to farmers markets yeah for sure <laughs> I have two jobs and I'm tribal chairwoman so yeah I don't have a lot of free time <laughs> we have a question on this side okay just on the right here what's a good resource to understand what might may be harmful and I asked that question because I had what looked like morel, I think that's how you say it, uh, mushrooms in my front yard. And apparently they can be really false. I know, there's, I, know that, I know that on Facebook and on Instagram, there's a lot of mushroom groups, especially in this area. Um, and they'll help you identify. Um, and so that would probably be my best bet for it. But I, cause I am not an identifier of mushrooms at all. I got to send pictures to my friends <laughs> um, to identify them for me. <laughs> I'm still learning. Yeah. 
We've got a question in the back. Okay, there's another question at the back, and also just a time check. Um, can't see. I think we've got time for another couple questions. Okay, two questions, one for, from the back. Thank you both very much for being here and for sharing your wisdom today. Uh, I really appreciated the example of likening a white sage bush to one's grandmother. And uh, I wanted to ask what another example would be of how to explain to someone who doesn't see plants as kin how connected we truly and deeply are. Um, I guess when you look at things as a whole ecosystem, um, you know, everything is re relies on everything else. So when we're talking about, um, like in the forestry, you know, the um, the shrubs on the ground rely on the um, the big trees above for protection from the sun. Um, the same thing, um, you know, with uh, when we talk about native plants and creating this relationship with them. Um, when we talk about the creation stories of native people here in Southern California, um, humans were created last. Um, in American society, humans are seen as superior to everything else. In native communities, people were created last to take care of everything that was created before them. And so that's our responsibility as humans, as native people, is to take care of everything that was created before us. That includes every plant, every animal, every insect, um, and to make sure that they are taken care of. That's really beautiful. We have time for two more questions. I have one right over here. Thank you. Um, first, thank you for calling like the plant a grandmother because I just started. I just finished teaching about the tree of life and how we're all related and connected. So, awesome. Um, <laughs> but uh, do you ever look to the sea for harvesting? And if oh, you do, yeah. what, what do you do? So we um, harvest. Um, animals from a sea. We, we, as native people who are coastal, um, we gathered, you know, shellfish and fish, but we also ate all kinds of seaweed and um, things that grow in the ocean. So yeah, we definitely harvest from them. And um, some of those marine areas are really protected. So we have a lot of issues with being able to gather, especially here in, you know, Orange County and LA County because, um, uh, the waters are so polluted, I don't think I would want to eat, you know, some of those things that are right on the, um, the coast, you know, um, in terms of plants. Um, but because those two tribes are not federally recognized, we have no um, ability to gather there. It's, you know, basically we're not permitted to gather. I know that a lot of the tribes up in Northern California do gather um, seaweed and stuff to eat. Mm -hmm. And this will be our last question. Hi, um, so I'm a avid gardener and I've been trying to get more into sustainable practices and kind of reevaluating how I impact the ecosystem as far as what I plant. Do you have a specific resource um, for like heirloom seeds or natives to the local environment that maybe someone who's not in a tribe or associated with someone could use to help, you know, recreate uh, the environment on their own? Yeah, so I would go to Native Seed Search that you can find all kinds of native seeds there. Um, I would, if you're interested in buying um, native plants, uh, Rancho Santa Ana Botanical Gardens um, and Tree of Life Nursery on Ortega Highway, those are great places to buy native plants. Um, they have everything from sage to junkus to woolly blue curls. Um, those are my, it's my favorite. Um, so um, they have all kinds of native plants and um, they both offer um, seeds as well. Yeah. Amazing. And um, I'm going to do a quick plug right now. Um, <laughs> so um, I just finished doing a documentary called Saging the World. It's premiering on um, the 22nd of, um, of April. Um, in San Pedro. So um, if you're really interested in learning about um, the appropriation of sage, what sage is used for, it's a great documentary. So um, yeah, that's my little plug. <laughs> Mark our calendars. Yeah. Hi, Dean.
Thank you so much for being our guests with us.